In the face of tremendous technological development at unprecedented and exponentially increasing speeds, we stand at a pivotal moment to decide whether or not we actively accelerate humanity's natural evolution. And if we do, then how? Welcome to Superhuman. Hi, Nick. Nice to see you. Hey, Brian. I think this is the first time we've ever uh, uh, talked. No, we actually met a couple years ago. Uh, where was that? Remind me. At TED conference. Oh, right. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah, yes. Good to well, see you again. Yeah, yeah. I'm just, I'm just uh, 20 years younger, so I look different. <laughs> that must be it. Yeah, and me, uh, unfortunately, it's gone in the opposite direction. Yeah. So, Nick, we have a great community here uh, all about health and longevity and the future of the human race. Uh, without question, AI is the most important thing happening on planet Earth. And as I survey the world of opinions, I mean, you've been writing about this. Um, I read your book, Superintelligence, when it came out. Uh, there's a really wide range of opinions. Some people are very excited about AI. Some people think it's the end of humanity. And these are really smart people, all with very divergent uh, views. How can you help us understand what do you think the situation is with AI and how do we think about it? Well, so I'm both um, uh, frightened and uh, excited about it at the same time. Uh, I say I'm a fretful optimist with respect to AI. I think it is not just one more cool technology like, you know, the mobile or cloud or web 2.0 or one of these things people get excited about from time to time, but really fundamentally different from everything else. Um, because it is the last invention we will ever need to make. If you have machines that can achieve the same general intelligence that we humans have and then super intelligence, uh, it really means that from that point onwards, further developments will be um, driven by these uh, machine intelligences. Um, and I think what that will mean is that we get the kind of telescoping of the future. So think of all those sci-fi technologies that maybe the human species could develop. If we had 20,000 years to work on it, you know, we'd have space colonies and perfect VR and cures for aging and uploading and all, all of those things, right? But I think what might have taken the human species 20,000 years to do, if you have super intelligences driving the research at digital time scales, might happen within, a, you know, a very brief period of time, you know, months or a few years or something like that. Um, and it looks like we are now actually rapidly advancing towards this point where we might be able to create um, super intelligence. So there's a lot of positive things that can happen with AI. Obviously, we all imagine the amazing things we can accomplish. A lot of people think that, uh, so I guess when I talk to people in AI, it seems to me that they bifurcate on, on two paths based upon the following model. The first group will say, things have been okay, things are okay, therefore things will be okay. So, for example, they'll say, don't worry about job loss. This is what happened during the Industrial Revolution. Humans find new things to do, for example. So, they'll take any argument that basically is negative or would be fear-inducing and say, we're going to sort things out. And then the other group of people will say, actually, this moment is different than the other moments. And then it branches off into their own reasoning of, of, of why there should be real concern about existential risk, about how we're not paying enough attention to AI safety. Do you identify with either one of these paths that you think things will be okay because things have been okay? Or do you say that this moment is different or would you classify yourself as a different way of thinking about this? I think this moment is different and we can't really infer too much from the fact that on balance so far it looks like technology has been good, um, at least for humans. I mean, if, if you look at sort of um, animals in, in our animal factories and stuff, maybe they would have a different opinion. But um, yeah, I, I think it is fundamentally different. Um, um, I think you could, if you zoom out and look at human history, you can sort of see two big transitions. So first from hunter-gatherer existence to agricultural existence. You know, 90% plus of humanity, we were just running around in small tribes. Um, and then with the agricultural revolution, we started to settle down and that led to the development of states um, specialization and the rate of development picked up uh, by orders of magnitude. And the second big transition is the industrial revolution where for the first time uh, economic 
growth became so rapid that it could outstrip population growth, which is the criterion for having average income rise above subsistence. So for all of human history before that, uh, the bulk of humanity always lived at subsistence level. You know, the economy grew, but, you know, the economy grew by 10%, the population grew by 10%, and you still were just barely able to survive. But for the last few hundred years, some parts of the world have kind of... And now the striking thing is we've taken this to be the normal way for things to be. But if, if you look at it in any, like, plausible way, it's like a huge anomaly. There's this normal human condition where you sort of, yeah. you know, maybe you have an alarm clock in the, in the morning, uh, you commute into your office, you struggle not to overeat, uh, you sit in front of a screen all day, like that. That's just not the way the human condition was meant to be and but but now people think that anything that projects into the future some radical departure of that is like some extraordinary hypothesis that seems crazy and would require some like very special evidence to believe whereas to me what seems crazy is to believe that this current moment will just be the way that things are for hundreds of years or thousands of years indefinitely into the future yeah so, um but yeah um so I, I think it is, it's very different, and, and one really needs to assess it more from first principles uh, r rather than just kind of extrapolate uh, previous uh, trend lines. So Nick, if you think this moment is fundamentally different, that we can't look back and match the patterns that have happened to the future, do you look to the future with hope, or do you look to the future with despair, and what is your p -dum? Yeah, uh, well, as I said, both uh, hope and, and not despair. I think um, as, 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 as long as there is ignorance, there is hope. Uh, <laughs> um, now, I would say I'm, I'm kind of a moderate fatalist. I think a lot of this might be baked in. To, th there are various challenges that will arise when we develop machine intelligence. One of these is the alignment problem. So how to develop scalable methods for AI alignment that will allow us to steer AI systems, even as they eventually become far smarter and more capable than us. And that is kind of an open research challenge right now, finally, like all the leading frontier AI labs, not all of them, but many of them have research groups working on this. And it's generally recognized that we need to solve this. Um, then there are other challenges with governance, et cetera. But um, whether we will solve those or not probably mostly depends on how hard these challenges turn out to be, which we don't really know. Uh, so that's the fatalism part, it's kind of baked in. And uh, the moderate part of being a moderate fatalist is I think on the margin, we can certainly improve the odds a bit. Like the more we get our act together, you know, maybe we can make some percentage points difference in, in the odds. Um, I've not really uh, expressed a precise P doom. I, I think there is a significant existential risk um, connected to this transition to the machine intelligence era. Nevertheless, I see it as a sort of portal through which we will have to passage at some point, like all the possible paths to really great futures for humanity uh, leads, I think, through this, this portal of the development of machine superintelligence. Yep. Um, it, it, it might be nice at the right time if whoever is developing this has the opportunity to, to pause or slow down for you know six months or a year to sort of work out all the safeguards to you know, rather than instantly cranking up all the uh, knobs to 11. Um, but ultimately, I think it would itself be a kind of existential catastrophe if we forever failed to uh, to take this next step. It's like, you know, playing a computer game, like you, you might want to explore a certain level, but at, at a certain point, it's maybe time to sort of, uh, you know, uh, level up and, and check, check the next level. Um, and I think we, we are kind of in that situation. Yep. All right, Nick, as the last question, uh, a bunch of people here, we are interested in the well-being of the human race. We see great potential for the future. What can those who are interested in doing that do about the situation? I mean, the, the race dynamics between nation states and companies to build the best AI are almost on a runaway train. It doesn't appear, absent some kind of catastrophic event in the world, it seems like race dynamics are going to take AI development at the fastest possible speed of discovery and capital. What can uh, those not in the AI, specifically trenches uh, building it, what can anyone else do? <clears throat> yeah, so this uh, is, is a big and difficult question. Um, I, I mean, I think um, 
it depends a little bit on where you are located in the world and sort of your unique skills and uh, opportunities to make a difference. Um, I think broadly speaking, we should be aiming towards a, a, a future uh, that is good for all, where I take all in a very wide sense here, so including all humans, um, but not just that, also animals, but also importantly the digital minds that we will be creating. So I think some of these digital minds uh, will have moral status, and, and in the future most minds I believe will be digital, so it's important that the future we steer to is, is one that is also good for what will be the majority population. And, and in fact, I mean, we ourselves might be either already, or uh, that's a separate conversation, but might become digital. I mean, this, this, the previous talk with the uh, Chronix uh, option, and then if you sort of come out of that, my guess is most likely it would be a some sort of upload. Um, so, so I think there is a, a big ethical challenge in sort of expanding uh, the, the circle of empathy to encompass concern <clears throat> for these uh, silicon implemented uh, AIs uh, and uploads that, that we are creating. This is going to be a big challenge because like even with animals, as I said earlier, we struggle, but they have like at least eyes that can squeak. But if it's like an invisible process running in a huge data center, it, it might you know be even more challenging for us. So one of the ways that I guess people could contribute is to sort of um, cultivate that sense of expansive compassion and, and empathy and, and then generally try to sort of steer towards a generous um, future. I think the good news is that if this works out, that the pie would be extremely large. That would be this unprecedented economic boom. Ultimately, we would unlock the resources of space. We would have super advanced technology. There, there would be more than enough to, to like give generous chunks to, to everybody. And um, so that, that should be our first instinct. First, make sure everybody has like plenty. Then, then we can sort of squabble over uh, the, the remainder. Um, so, so those are some general directional uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, efforts that, that, that people can contribute to in different ways. Um, um, so I, I would say there's the alignment problem. That's mostly, I think, for technical people in, in AI labs and other places. Then the governance challenges, that's not a thing you solve once and for all, but it will be sort of managing this transition as it unfolds and figuring out how to notch things in a desirable direction. Then expanding this empathy to encompass digital minds, although it's very hard right now to know exactly concretely what you would do there, but I think starting with the principle at least is good. And then I think there's like a fourth area of challenge, but that's even less clearly visible right now, but ultimately this super intelligence, if we create one, will maybe enter a world where there exist other super intelligences, whether built by alien civilizations, or if we are in a simulation, our simulators, or if there are other branches of the Everett universe, mm -hmm. uh, traditional theological beings, they, they would all be in this bracket of super beings if they exist. And so ultimately I think it's also really important that our super intelligence gets along with these other uh, super beings, um, and, and it's a kind of cooperative in that space. Um, but this, yeah, it, I, I don't have a sort of, uh, itemized to-do list for each person. It's like, I'm, I've been thinking about these things for decades and I'm still very kind of groping in the dark here. It, yeah. It's just going to be a hard challenge. So would it be fair to say, we don't know what to do? Um, yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that would yeah. be fair to do, but we still got to do. <laughs> yeah, cool. Nick, we're out of time. Uh, really appreciate you hanging out with us today. Great to see you. Good to see you.